Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. I don't think I'd get any pushback if I said that new patients are an extremely important thing for your practice. I think I'd get more or less 100% universal agreement on that statement. Well, with new patients being so important and generally speaking, marketing efforts being costly or some more costly than others, it pays to be able to maximize these efforts and ensure that whatever you're doing to get new patients is being done at maximum efficiency. The problem is the whole new patient acquisition process covers a lot of areas from uh, external marketing to internal marketing to good phone skills to the new patient experience when the patient comes in to be able to retain them to how your team handles patients when they're in the office. There's a lot of different moving parts. So it's sometimes hard to keep track of all of them. And you might have some of the, the processes functioning well in your office while others aren't. For example, your marketing might be working and getting you a lot of phone calls but whoever's answering the phone doesn't have the proper skill set uh, to schedule these patients and get them in quickly. So what we created several years back for our clients is something called a new patient management action checklist. And it checklisted out all of the points you want to have in in your practice. And the way this check checklist is used is you compare it up against your office, almost like when you bring your car to a dealership and they have a 10-point service checklist. These are the 10 things they're going to check to make sure that your car is opti or, or operating optimally. So we have this checklist for a dental practice that you can use and compare it up against your office to see what might be working and what not, might not be working so that you can really maximize your marketing and new patient efforts. And that's what I want to cover in this week's episode. My name is Jeff Bloomberg, and I'm your host. And rather than just giving you this checklist as a download, which we are, you can download this checklist and follow along with me in this episode if you'd like. But rather than just giving you the checklist, I wanted to spend a bit of time covering different aspects of it. And the reason for that is this. When I first introduced this checklist to our client base, it was actually both uh, Sabri and I. Sabrina and I, Sabrina and me, Sabrina and I introduced this checklist to the client base. We actually did it as a live stream uh, to the MGE client base because we wanted to explain how these different points are used. There's also a couple of other, other things you, are, you need to use on this checklist, which you may not have right now. So it's better to explain it so you understand how the different points uh, work. So yeah, you can download the checklist. The link to the checklist is on the episode webpage. If you're not driving in your car uh, while you're listening to this, please don't be reading the checklist while you're doing that. I would recommend that you download it because you're going to want to use it in your office. And uh, we'll just go through it. And I'm going to go through it and how it works. And you, you compare this up against your office. And I'll go over a couple of the peculiarities with some of the points. All right. So what is this checklist for? It's designed to provide structure to your new patient acquisition efforts. So the idea would be you take these checklists and it breaks down into about six different areas from basic requirements to marketing requirements to phone skills to the new patient experience to also some of your team requirements. You would basically go through it and see how this is manifested or not manifested in your practice. Does it need work or is it working and so on. So we'll start off with the first section which are is basic requirements, basic requirements. So let's go through this. So there are three points here. Point number one is you have to have someone responsible for new patients. I've spoken about in a number of different episodes the importance of having a division of labor so that someone is ultimately accountable for specific important functions in your practice. This also applies to new patients. Uh, very often when I meet with a new client, I'll ask, you know, who's responsible for new patients? And the answer I'll get, especially if I'm talking to the doctor and the office manager, is I guess me. I guess me. Think about that for a second. If you're responsible for something, I guess me. That, that, that doesn't quite work. Also, if you tell the whole team, we're all responsible for new patients, tell everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. So someone has to be ultimately accountable for your new patient efforts. Now, this really depends on the size of your practice, how you're going to roll this out. If you have a larger practice, you might employ a PR director, and this person is just 100% focused on new patient acquisition. This is their full-time gig. In a smaller office, it might be the office manager, um, or you might have somebody who's going to do it part-time, like a particular dental assistant who's you know fairly enterprising and wants to get into this. This might be what they do. But one person has to be ultimately responsible for new patients and the new patient statistic. They own it. All right, point number two, you need to target 
your new patient numbers every month. You need to set a goal for these numbers. Now, I know most offices are used to setting some form of a production goal. And that's fine. Uh, just as an aside, if you're setting a production goal, I would also set a collections goal because you could produce all you want. If you don't collect it, it's actually worse. But you should also be setting a new patient goal. You know, I want to get seven new patients a week. I want to get 10 new patients a week or I want to get 50 new patients this month. So that's point number two. And point number three, the entire team has to be aware of what you're doing for new patient acquisition. So what does that mean? A, they're aware of whatever goals you set. We want 50 new patients this month because you never know. Your receptionist might be talking to a patient and say, oh, you know, my wife's been thinking about uh, seeing the dentist and she doesn't have one. And, you know, it's the 26th of the month and they have a new patient opening and they get them to schedule their wife. You see, everybody's thinking with this. We have a goal of 50 this month. The other thing is everybody has to be familiar. Every single team member has to be familiar with how the practice is marketing and what the different marketing offers are or different marketing activities are. Now, why is this? Let's say you launch some type of a campaign for, uh, you know, permanent implant dentures and all on four and all on six. You do this whole marketing campaign. You're I don't know, you're, you're doing something on Google and maybe you're doing something in the newspaper because people read the newspaper in your area. And your receptionist has no clue about this. Now, normally an ad is going to have some form of a call to action. Okay, so just to clear that up, if you don't know what that is, if you look at any ad, it'll say call now to find out about blah or call now to get the so-and-so special. That's considered a call to action or, or fill out this form. Okay, so let's say the call to action is the person is supposed to call for a free cone beam x-ray and a uh, an evaluation. That's the, the offer. That's the call to action. But you haven't informed anybody in the practice that you're doing this marketing activity. You're doing it on Google or you have some type of an implant funnel or something, okay? So then people start calling your office and get your receptionist on the phone saying, hey, yeah, I'm calling for my free cone beam x-ray and blah. The receptionist goes, what are you talking about? Maybe they wouldn't be like that, but they would be a bit confused. So you don't want to have that happen. Anytime I do any type of a new activity that isn't just same old, same old, you know, like we promote the new patient workshop very heavily and other things here at MGE. But if it's not something that the receptionist is going to be familiar with, I make sure that the receptionist is brought into the loop so that they know what's going on. So you ideally want the whole team to know what's going on. I do it at staff meetings with the MGE team. Our clients do it the same way so that when patients are calling off of different types of marketing, the uh, staff are aware of what they are calling about and more importantly, what they are supposed to do with that. Maybe you have a certain slot where you want to see those types of patients or certain days. You know, they're not scheduling a patient for an implant evaluation on date. Maybe you're the only one in the practice who places implant and your associate doesn't. So you wouldn't want to have that patient scheduled on a day when you're not there. Okay. So those are basic requirements. All right. So let's move on to the next point. External marketing. These are the checklist points on external marketing, things that you want to have in, okay? Because the, the, the concept of this checklist, which again, you can download from the episode webpage, is that if all of these points were in and functioning, you would be at an optimal operating level for new patients. You would be getting as many as you want. It would be done efficiently and extremely cost effectively, and you would retain people for a long time. All right. So next point, section two is external marketing. So what are some of the points here? Point number one is uh, marketing channels. And the statement is, I have multiple external marketing channels for the practice. You don't want to be a one-trick pony. You're sending out a postcard or you're doing Facebook ads. You want to have multiple channels for marketing. Now, you don't do multiple channels just for the sake of doing multiple channels. You also want a degree of redundancy. Let's say you have a, you're have you running a Facebook pay-per-click campaign or a Facebook ad campaign, rather, and a Google pay-per-click campaign, and you have a postcard going out. These are your three primary marketing channels. Well, what if all of a sudden uh, something goes wrong and the, the PPC, the pay-per-click campaign, starts to lose its effectiveness? If that's your only source of new patients, you're going to be in trouble. But maybe that's going wrong and you're spending a bit of time fixing that, but your postcard campaign and your Facebook ad, ad campaign is working fine. So you want to have multiple channels not only to expand your new patient acquisition efforts, um, and they should all work, okay? But you want a degree of redundancy. All right, point number two. I know the monthly cost for each of these, meaning these different channels. So you know how much it costs you to run a Facebook campaign. Maybe you have a company doing the campaign for you. So you're probably paying a service fee to that company to run the campaign and you're paying um, an ad fee. You're paying for its ad spend, in other words. So I know how much I'm spending to pay the company to run the campaign and I know how much I've authorized as ad spend. 
you know, if I was running a Google pay per click campaign, I'm paying somebody to manage the campaign. Maybe I'm paying them a thousand bucks a month, $500 a month, whatever that number is. And I'm spending 1500 a month on ad spend because that number is completely predictable and controllable. I tell you, you can spend 1500 and no more. So then it cuts off at that point if they've spent the 1500 or they figure out a way to make sure that it's, you know, lasts me a month. All right. But I know everything, single thing I'm sending out, I know how much it costs me for each one. Now, I will tell you that most people, not just dentists, but most business owners have no idea. And this is a big mistake because this is how – maybe it's a bad way of saying it. Marketing gets a bad name. But this is how you get in trouble because if you don't know what you're spending, then you don't know if your marketing efforts are actually working, okay, if you don't know what you're spending. And by working, how much is each new patient costing you, which I'll get into in a second. But if you don't know, you don't know how effective it is. So it's important to know how much you're spending. All right, point number three, tracking. I regularly track the number of calls and reaches from each of these channels. So calls or a reach, what do we mean by a reach? A reach would be a response because when you promote, you're not going to get new patients. You're going to get a response. That's another thing to think of too. If I'm sending out a postcard, a new patient does not magically materialize in my office. Sure, I'll get the occasional person who just walks into the practice with a postcard, but what you most often get is a phone call, okay, or a form. Maybe there's a QR code, you know, one of those scanny codes on the postcard. They scan it and they fill out a form. I'm getting a response because that's how I tell if my marketing is working. If those responses aren't being scheduled, that's an internal problem. That's a receptionist problem or a, a scheduler problem. That is not a marketing problem. The marketing is supposed to create a call a response or what we might call a reach, meaning the person is reaching into the business. So you're tracking these reaches. Now to properly track these reaches, I want you to think about this for a second because again, this is really a case where things that are unimportant get get a lot of attention placed on them and where things that are of urgent importance get completely ignored. I, I've over the years, I've pushed this for years with clients. I've pushed this for years with newer clients. And, you know, eventually our clients really get this into place. But if you are not tracking what response you are getting from what marketing you are doing, you are operating blind. So let's say you're sending out whatever you're doing. You're doing Facebook, Google, and postcards. And you're getting 50 new patients a month. And those are the only two things you know. You're spending X amount and you're getting 50 new patients a month. If you don't know where you're getting those new patients from, what marketing thing they came from, okay, uh, you're going to, you're not going to know what to spend more on. If you want to get more new patients, what do you spend money on? You haven't determined where they're coming from. I mean, heck, 40 of those 50 could be coming from referrals for all you know, and you'd want to beef up your referral activity. So you have to track where these folks are coming from. Now, I'm going to give you a download. I've, ha I've given it out before. It's called a new patient call log. And this is one of those things that you're going to have to continuously push with your receptionist till it becomes second nature. Receptionists get busy. I forgot to ask. I forgot to write it down. Completely unacceptable. You might go, well, you know, my postcard has a number that records the call. Do you want to listen to all those phone calls? You should be listening to some. I'll talk about that in a little bit later. But this should just be written down. It's not that difficult. How might that go? What made you call us today? How did you find out about us? Oh, I got something in the mail. Oh, which was it? Was it a postcard? Yeah, it was a postcard. What did it have on it? You might Now, what we do is we use a code on my postcard. So it'll say, you know, if it's a new patient workshop, it would be NPW 723, meaning that's new patient workshop postcard for July of 2023. So you could say, look, on the bottom right corner, does it have a couple numbers? Yeah, it says... Um, it says C723, like cleaning 723, whatever, whatever, however you want to code it, it really doesn't matter. If you don't have a code, you could say, what, what does it have on the postcard? What well, has a blonde lady on the front? Okay, so you know which postcard that is. But you should be tracking what is coming from everything because maybe what if you're doing three different types of postcards and one is really pulling and the other ones aren't? You know, maybe the one with the whole family on the front is really pulling, but the one with a lady or a guy on the front isn't. Well, then I'd want to do more with the one on the family. You see, this isn't this isn't brain surgery, but it does take some work. It's actually very – a lot of marketing. So it's funny. Most people think of marketing as you have to be inspired or this or that, and there is some of that in there. But I could turn anybody into a decent marketer because a lot of marketing is just administrative work. Tracking things, what's working, what's not, how much did we spend on this, how much is it costing us to get this person. Okay, so you have to do this. All right, point number four, 
acquisition. I know our acquisition cost for each marketing channel. So what's the acquisition cost? It's how much I spent to get two things. One, how much I spent for the phone call, and two, how much I spent for the new patient. So if I spend $1,000 on Facebook ads and I get 100 phone calls, I'm spending $10 a phone call. 1000 bucks for the ads, 100 phone calls, $10 a call. So my, my, my call cost is 10 bucks. And then my acquisition cost, let's say out of those 100 phone calls, we scheduled 10 patients. So $1,000 we spent, 100 phone calls, 10 patients scheduled. So my acquisition cost per new patient was $100. So I know a lot just from those three numbers. Number one, I know I spent $1,000. Okay, not, not bank breaking, right? Not terrible. I got 100 phone calls. That's amazing. I mean, if you ever give that, that's amazing. Okay, it's like 10% response, okay? So 1000 bucks, got 100 phone calls. That's great. This ad is working. But we only scheduled 10 new patients. Okay, so I have a problem with my conversion, number one. We're converting at 10%. Okay. But number two, I'm spending $100 per new patient. So let's say I check that up against my Google and I'm spending $50 per new patient, which by the way, these numbers are going to be a lot higher, but I'm just trying to keep the math, you know, in round numbers. Say I'm doing the same thing on Google. I'm spending a thousand bucks, getting a hundred phone calls and we're, or a thousand bucks. I'm getting 200 phone calls and we're scheduling uh, you know, 30 new patients. Well, my acquisition cost is lower for Google than it is for Facebook. So if I were going to push something up in addition to handling my receptionist to get better at conversion, I'm probably going to do more Google than I do Facebook. This is why you want to know your acquisition cost. Cause let's say I'm doing something else and I find out it's costing me a thousand bucks a new patient where I have all these other things I'm doing that are costing me, I don't know, 200 bucks, 150 bucks. Well, I'm probably going to drop that and do more of the other stuff. So that's why it's important to know. All right, point number five, new patient offer. So when you do a postcard or anything, you should have, you should even have new patient offers on your website, like right on your homepage. Like I get to your homepage and it already has a new patient offer on there. Your new patient offer should be consistent on external marketing. Now, you could offer many different things. I've seen postcards or ads with three options where I go to your website and there's an option for a discounted cleaning. There's an option for a second opinion and there's an option for, uh, you know, a, a free cone beam and a this and that to get evaluated because I'm missing teeth, like an exam and a cone beam. All right. To see if I'm a candidate for implants. So there's three different things I can capitalize on. So you're sort of playing to your different people who might be looking at this. You're playing to the new patient people who just are looking for a dentist and you're playing to the folks uh, who want a second opinion and folks who are missing teeth. That's fine. But if I'm offering a cleaning exam and x-rays, let's say I'm doing a cleaning, uh, initial oral exam and a full mouth x-ray. And let's say I'm offering it at my normal profi price, which is $110. Let's say the whole appointment's $312 between the full mouth and the exam. Am, but my profi is 110. Well, I'm offering this at a discounted price for 110 bucks. And you know, the only thing you want to be smart about is different states and provinces in Canada have different requirements on what you're supposed to say along with the ad. Some states require that you put the CDT code in there, you know, code 1110 or D1110, th things like this, right? Just be smart about this. So uh, whatever. But so you, you do that. Let's say I'm charging 110 for this discounted cleaning exam and x-rays. Well, if I'm doing a postcard and I'm promoting a discounted cleaning exam and x-rays, the price should be the same. I don't want somebody to get a postcard and it says it's $94 and then they go to my website, it's $110. It looks like I don't know what I'm doing. So you want consistency. It doesn't mean you have to only advertise one thing, but whatever I'm advertising should be uniform across all ad platforms. Point number six is ROI. What does ROI stand for? Return on investment. So the statement is, I track ROI for each external marketing channel using realized revenue by the practice. Okay, this one's a bit later on the chain. So your acquisition cost is how much it costs you to get that new patient. Or then you have ROI, meaning I spent, because so, this could, your, your new patient marketing could get specialized. So again, I'm doing, let's say, I don't know, an implant funnel or some form of marketing for, uh, you know, larger implant cases, all on fours, all on sixes, things like this. So here's the deal where I could spend, I don't know, $10,000 and I'm, I might only get, I don't know, five patients off this. Well, if I spent $10,000 and I got five patients who came in for a cleaning, that would be horrible. I'm spending $2,000 a patient for, let's say, my average 
charge per patient that sticks with the practice for a year is 1500 bucks a patient. So, you know, the average patient pays me 1500 I spent $10,000. I got five new patients. So they paid for their discounted cleaning. And then I made an additional 1500 per patient or $7,500. So I made like $8,000 if you include the cleanings and spent 10. That's terrible. That's, that's a negative return on investment. Versus if I'm advertising for an all on four, and the patient's calling in for an evaluation, and I end up with five cases out of this. After spending five thousand or $10,000, rather, I get five cases, and these five cases average $40,000 a case. Well, you know, now I've made $200,000 by spending 10. That's an excellent ROI. That's 20 to 1. So you want to track the ROI. Now, the trick with the ROI is track what period are you going to pick. If you're going to pick, I'd probably say the first I don't know, three to six months, um, it really is arbitrary. It's what you decide. But I would at least give yourself enough time to track that the patient actually followed through with treatment, and that varies by practice. It might be – so you might want to do a month to three months uh, after the person comes in. So, okay, I got 10 new patients from this marketing channel. I spent this much. And then you look after – one to three months, and this is the realized revenue by the practice. Those 10 new patients paid us $140,000, and you can compare that up against what you spent, and you'll get return on investment, okay? So remember, the three numbers we want, cost per call, acquisition cost, cost per new patient, and then the third number we want is return on investment, which has a lag or a delay in it. All right, last couple points here on external marketing. Number eight, pilots. I pilot different methods of marketing and offers to determine which performs the best. Now, why do you want to continuously pilot marketing? For a few reasons. One, marketing can grow stale. It, it, it happens. So you can either rehab – that's something you have to do regularly because I've seen some people who just – you know, I made a postcard and I've used it for four years and it's still just not getting responses anymore and I don't know why. Well, people have become numb to it. You know, and To that end, this is just something that happens in life. You know, it, Look at your desk. You may have things sitting on your desk that have been there or in your basket for six months. You just got used to seeing it and it becomes like part of the furniture, right? You have these two folders that have been sitting on the corner of your desk for six months. That happens to us. Well, the same thing will happen with your marketing if you're doing the same thing over and over again. So your marketing can get stale. So you're gonna have to keep it switched up, whether it's your Google ads or whatever postcards you're doing or Facebook ads, or et cetera. But then also um, a marketing channel can kind of get stale. It can get saturated. You know, and everybody's doing email and everybody's doing this. So you want to always have different things you can switch over to. So you want to be constantly exploring different things to do. You know, a lot of doctors are on you – know, a lot of the early adopters of Instagram did real well. I know one client who got a ton of new patients from Instagram, he was a very early adopter. Now you have a lot of people on Instagram. So then a lot of dentists went to TikTok. And some get a ton of new patients there because you have to spend time to build up the following and the posts have to be regular. So you want to constantly be looking at different marketing channels to put yourself on and give them a try or we're piloting it, meaning we're giving it a test run. All right. Number nine, planning. My external marketing is planned well in advance. Now, this is crucial because a lot of external marketing channels take time to get up and running. If you're going to start an implant funnel, you're looking at at least a month or so. If you want to get a Facebook pay-per-click going with a landing page or, or a Google pay-per-click, Facebook ad, sorry, or Google pay-per-click going with a landing page, that's going to be a month or so to get that up unless you can make it yourself. Postcards take time to print. So I would at least have for the next quarter what I'm planning on doing. I would have a schedule and I'd have it laid out. Now by I, I mean the person who's responsible for it, whoever in your office has been elected and has agreed to be responsible. Uh, it has this marketing schedule that you could look at at any given time, including your ROI and all this type of stuff to make sure that you guys stay on top of it and it's not just a mad rush to get something out. All right, so that's the external marketing section. Let's move to the internal marketing section of this checklist. All right, so let's move on to part three here, which is our internal marketing. So what's step one here? A program. We have an established internal marketing program in our practice, meaning there's some structure. There's something we're doing. There's a way we do it. It's not just, hey, we ask for referrals once in a while. And to that end, and in this section, if, you've, if you're reading along with me, you'll see a program mentioned the Care Enough to Share program or Care to Share program. What the Care to Share program is is a series of steps 
which uh, walks you through using a, a – it's like a, a postcard – or not a postcard. It's more like a business card sized little card that you actually use to get patients to refer other patients to your practice and it tells you exactly how to use it. I'll probably do an episode on using the care to share and maximizing it here uh, in the not too far future. I know it's on my schedule. But the care to share program can be downloaded if you want. It's uh, – seven to 10 pages. Uh, I'll put a link to it on the episode webpage if you want to start using it now. So, okay. So that was step one. You have an established internal marketing program in the practice. Step two, training. The staff have been trained on this program and I regularly ding in the importance of using it. So we've trained our staff on how to use this program, whatever it is that we're doing, if it's the Care Enough to Share program as an example, and you regularly ding in the importance of it. What does ding in mean? It means to repeat to the point of being tiresome. So this is the reason, by the way, a lot of things you've tried to implement in the past did not stay implemented. Because when you're doing something new, you want to make it part of somebody's everyday routine. You want to make it something that they're doing on a regular basis. And I don't know what the, the science behind this is. I mean, there's this concept that it takes, what is it, 21 days to change a habit? I think it takes longer. But it's has, it's constant repetition. This is why things you've tried to implement don't stay implemented. So if you're training the staff on how to give out these referral cards, let's say you do it once, you get all excited about it, you tell the staff, you give them the cards, you go, good, let's give this to every patient or more patients we want more of. You know, the, the, in other words, we like this patient. We want more of their friends and family because they're really cool. You know, so uh, you tell them about it once. And then you don't talk about it again for two weeks because you just expect they're all doing it. Then you go, hey, how many cards are we giving out? Oh, yeah, you know, I forgot. Oh, yeah. So that doesn't work. It has to be something you're bringing up all the time. Every staff meeting, you're training on it regularly. You're statusizing it. How many cards have we given out this week? It's something that you're dinging in. You're continuously throwing it out there so that people make it second nature. You could apply this to anything in the business for that matter. Uh, if you're putting in a new meeting time, like a morning huddle, you have to constantly do it and repeat it and do it and do it. Eventually, people make it second nature. All right. Number three is drilling. We regularly drill practice how to execute steps of this program with the team. For example, how to give out a care to share card, et cetera. So if you don't train somebody on this and drill it, what does it mean to drill it? So you want me to give out this referral card. Let's say I'm a hygienist. You want me to give it out to this patient who's their good patient. So I'm going to give them this card, explain to them what it's for, maybe give them a couple of the cards, and it's a way for them to refer their friends and family. So you haven't walked me through how to do this yet. Um, you know, I, I don't know what to say. The chances are I'm not going to give any out. Maybe the occasional person will because they have the gift of the gab, but the average person won't. So you would role play it with me. Maybe the office manager would sit down with the hygienist and go, okay, good. I'm a prospective patient or you're a prospective patient and I'm you. Here's what I would say. Hey, listen, just so you know, we love having you as a patient and, and so on. Right. And so, you know, we're always looking for more new patients because some people don't know that you're accepting new patients. And if you want to refer your friends and family here or whatever, however you want to do this. Okay. And then you do it. You show them how you want to do it. We have some ideas on the Care Enough to Share program that you can look at. And then you hand the patient the card. You explain to them how it works. And then you have the hygienist do it. And they have them do it again. And they have them do it again. Have them do it again. Have them do it again. So they can, they feel really comfortable with it. And then they do it with patients. And of course, the first time is not going to be as good as the, the 10th time, but then they're at least comfortable enough to start doing it. And you want to drill this. Anything that is an important core part of your business process should be drilled regularly, even if people already know how to do it because it keeps them sharp. All right. Number four, surveys. I do regular quality control surveys on my patient base to ensure customer service is excellent. Now, Quality control surveys may or may not be used. You may use a third-party company to do them. There's lots of ways to do this. Or you just may make a simple survey that you email out to a portion of the patient base or people that have been in the practice in the last month, two months, or whatever. And some people will fill it out and some people won't. Now, why is it important to do this? I mean, this is why you want quality control in everything you're doing. If you have somebody who's doing a poor job at something, whether it's scheduling or collecting money or your hygienist or whomever, maybe the hygienist is really nice, but they're very rough when they're in somebody's mouth, okay? If they're doing this and you don't handle it, that mistake or problem is being perpetuated with every single patient. The problem is most people who are upset aren't going to just jump on the internet and leave an nasty review. They may say nothing and just may not come back. Okay. So th there's that old concept. What is it? Like a, a satisfied person tells one person and someone who's complaining tells six. I forget the exact way it went. But whether that's true or not, the last thing I would want is an unhandled complaint. So you want to 
get out there regularly to see if your patients, if there's anything you need to fix or handle. And I would jump on the smallest stuff. You know, I really didn't like how my experience went with billing. I thought it was this much. You want to address this stuff because that stuff left to fester does get worse and it can cost you in the long run. All right. Point number five is correction. I take corrective action immediately, internally and externally, when a customer service problem arises. I was just mentioning this. You don't sit on this. This is urgent because, again, if you have a staff member who's committing a mistake, I'm not saying you have to fire them. You may just have to fix something. But they're doing it, and they're doing it routinely. They're going to perpetuate that mistake on everybody they deal with. Number eight, asking for referrals. At some point during the visit, we check with every new patient, and patient of record about bringing in other members of their household to the practice as new patients. This is something that the, uh, a lot of MGE clients have down to a T. We have some clients that are, are amazing at this. They take wrong numbers and turn them into new patients. I was talking to somebody uh, last week that had a plumber come over because they were having trouble with their water. You know, their water was going on and off intermittently, intermittently in the ops. So they call a plumber over. Plumber was missing some teeth. They scheduled him as a new patient. Right. So if you're on the lookout for new patients constantly, that's a lot easier to do with a patient of record, of course, because they're already a patient in your practice. You ideally, every household has, on average in the United States, the average number of people in a household is three people. So, you know, we've had clients tell us that they have a family practice, and then we have them actually run the numbers out of the practice, and you'll find that they have a thousand names and 800 addresses. Okay. So a thousand patients with 800 addresses means they're getting one point, what is that? Two, 1.15 patients from each household. So they're missing a lot of prospective new patients. And in many cases, that is a simple question of asking. You have a new patient, she comes in, you talk to her, Hey, is there anybody else in your household that might be looking for a dentist? Well, you know, my husband doesn't have one yet. Well, you know, your husband can get the new patient special. Can we go ahead and schedule him? Yeah. Let me call him real quick. Boom. Scheduled. That, that new patient cost you zero and you want lots of those because they'll help to defer your marketing costs. You don't want to stop your marketing. You got to do your external marketing, but it helps to defer that cost. If I spent – think about this. If I spent $300 to acquire that new patient, right? That lady came in. I spent $300 for a postcard or a Google pay click ad. She came in and now she scheduled her husband. I've just cut my acquisition cost to $150. It was 300 for her, but now I got her and her husband. Now it's 150. Let's say it was her husband and her kid. Well, now I cut my acquisition cost to 100 bucks. So this is something, if you wanted to, anything you really wanted to push the pedal to the metal on, this is something you can start the second you turn this podcast off. Bring your staff in, drill them on it a bit, get comfortable with it, and start immediately. You should be doing this every single day. All right, and number seven, promoting to patients of record. This is also important. You want to keep your patient base active. We send out regular correspondence, including a patient newsletter to our patients of record. We regularly promote in it and we're accept that we're accepting new patients in this correspondence or newsletter. So your newsletter should point up that you're accepting new patients. They can refer the, their family and friends. This might include some type of fam, family and friends special as you use in the Care Enough to Share program. So it could be, you know, bringing a family member, they can save 50 bucks, bringing a family member for a cleaning exam and x-rays for $99, whatever that might be. You're promoting this to your patient base. I would send out a newsletter on a quarterly basis. And I've said this before, I would do something simple. Don't buy one of those canned newsletters. They're just going to get tossed. Uh, buy something that you make yourself. I don't care if you have a designer making it, but make it simple. You don't have, uh, even if you have 5,000 patients, it's not the kind of money you're going to spend if you were sending out something to everybody in your community. So make it simple. You can have some cool stuff in there. Do your seasonal mailings, you know, back to school, use your insurance before the end of the year, do all that kind of good stuff, right? But you want regular correspondence to these patients to keep them active. All right. So that's our internal marketing section. Let's move to phone skills. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we've done several episodes on phone skills. We really dissected this a bit. But this something is something you want to check against the office because some of this has to do with the schedule. All right. So number one, the schedule. My schedule is set up so that I have available or blocked time to get a new patient initial exam into my practice within 24 to 48 hours. So if I call your practice – and I say, hey, I've just moved to the area and I'm looking for a dentist. You have an opening you can put me in within the next 24 to 48 hours. If you don't, this is a problem, especially if you're marketing. If I call, remember, I have no, I have no connection with you. I saw your ad. I got your postcard. I call and you say, well, we can get you in in three and a half weeks. 
chances are I'm going to hang up the phone and call another office, even if I schedule with you, because I'm going to find somebody who can see me sooner. I'm excited now. I want to be seen soon. You know, we've all gotten used to this. I don't know if you'd be cliche, but the, the United States public, I mean, I think this is really almost a global problem. We've all gotten used to getting everything right now since the internet and Amazon and things like this. We want it all right now. To get a movie, you used to have to go to Blockbuster or to uh, Redbox or something, whatever it was, uh, you know, when Netflix was DVD, you had to wait, okay? Now you can get it immediately. We all want it right now. The new patient should get in right now. If you're not doing this, you could actually destroy your marketing efforts because you're you're wasting that opportunity. Now, if I call and I say, you tell me, well, we have an opening day after tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Oh, I can't come in till I usually have to get an early, early morning appointment. When is your first appointment at 730 in the morning available? Oh, next Monday. Okay, I'll take that one. Fine. If I'm the one pushing it further than 20 to 40 to 48 hours, that's on me. But you should always have some availability. Our next point, second opinions or consults can be seen within 24 to 48 hours. Same concept applies. Emergencies, new patients and patients of record can be seen the same day. All right, that's important. Now, in our scheduling episodes, which were done a while back, we talked about that a little bit, how to do that. And then we have new patient inquiries via email, social media, or a website. In other words, not a phone call. It's a form lead, okay, where they sent a form in. New patient inquiries via email, social media, or a website are handled the same day or if during open office hours within 10 minutes. So if something pops up on Facebook, Haiti, how much do you guys charge for a crown? You're on that person within 10 minutes. You're talking to them. Good. You know what? I'd be happy to talk to you. Do you have a moment to take a phone call? All right. This brings us to our next point, phone skills. Anyone who answers the phone in my practice has been A, thoroughly trained on how to handle new patient calls, and B, is regularly drilled two to four times a month on handling new patient calls. You have to do this. You have to keep this fresh. Number three, monitoring. I regularly listen to random samplings of incoming new patient calls, even if my personnel are trained on the subject, assuming it's legal to record these calls in your locality. So you most likely have some form of a cloud-based system where you can listen to incoming calls. There's a certain number of patients call. Maybe it's for your postcard or your Google ad. You need to listen to those regularly. Now, and, and I think my next point here, if it's a newer employee, you have to listen to every call. But you should be listening to these several times a week because otherwise you're going to miss stuff. And then you're going to wonder what's going on. It's just something if you're an office manager, you need to build this into, or if you're a doctor, get your office manager to build this into their day-to-day. It should be several times a week they're listening to a random sampling of calls. Which brings me to the next point I was bringing up, number four, new employees. If someone is a new is newer at handling these calls, I listen to each new patient call to ensure core competence. If I have somebody new on the phone, I'm listening to every call, and I'm correcting as I go which is number five, correction. I quickly correct any errors made in handling new patient or other calls. Because again, if I have somebody perpetuating an error, you know, when would you like to schedule, sir? When would you like to come in? Does it matter that your insurance isn't active yet? Like they're asking questions, giving the patient the option to just not come in. You want to correct that stuff immediately because they're going to do it with the next new patient phone call if you don't. All right, number six, New patient log. I already mentioned this earlier. I have a new patient log at the front desk and it is filled out properly every time we get a call. This is something you have to stay on top of just like listening to call recordings. You have to make sure it's in use to the point where people are so used to doing it that it's almost alien to them when they don't use it. Okay. Number seven, tracking. I track the conversion rate for all new patient calls and can break them down by marketing channel. So not only do I track my overall conversion rate, I got 100 phone calls and we scheduled 60 new patients. I know that out of that 100 phone calls, 20 of them came from Facebook and we scheduled 14 of them. So you have to be able to break it down that way or whoever's handling new patients to be able to show you. Number eight, after hours. My phones are answered after hours by someone who can schedule patients in my practice, may or may not be applicable. Now, very few people have this in place and it really depends on where you are. But we had a client in New York do this where, you know, in New York, people are used to being able to see dentists at all kinds of wild hours, especially in the city. So what he did, their office was open normal hours, four or five days a week, you know, normal business hours, eight to 530 or whatever. He had one of his employees start answering the phone up until 11 o'clock. It wasn't just one person. I think they round robin did. One person did it one night. And of course, he paid him for this. One did it another and so on. And as new patients went up, a lot, like 50 to 60 new patients a month, because a lot of people were calling after hours. And not all of them were emergency calls that they couldn't see that day. Some of them were just people looking for a dentist to get a cleaning and they didn't know anything about them. So the fact that someone answered the phone and was able to schedule the patient, which is so much easier now with cloud-based software, uh, actually increased the new patients. We found this out in kind of a weird roundabout way 
years back uh, when we started promoting to the West Coast. You know, we're, we're located, our main office is on the East Coast. It's in Florida. We moved from Virginia to Florida, Fairfax, Virginia, in the D.C. area. We moved to Florida in 2003. We're on Eastern Standard Time. So I'm sending out mailings to California. Well, California has a three-hour time delay. So we're open from, you know, our phones are answered from nine in the morning till six at night. Okay, but that's three o'clock in the afternoon in California. So someone's calling me from California uh, at f- five o'clock their time from my seminar promo. They're getting an answering machine. We now, that's not a problem because we have a California office now. But before I had an office, I had somebody that we hired actually in California part-time to answer the phones when we shut our phones off here. And it actually increased our our, uh, new client numbers a lot because we were catching phone calls we were missing before. In your case, because you're you're a direct consumer type business, you may have people calling you at seven or eight at night. So something, I would look at it. You can look at how many calls you're missing when you're not there and you might find it's quite a few, in which case it might be worth having somebody do that. Okay, next is section five, which is arrival in the practice. Now we're into the new patient experience and we're almost done with this checklist. I know this is a bit of a longer episode, but we're bulling through it, right? All right, so I've I've exceeded the 30 minute mark here. All right, so section five is arrival in the practice. Now is the new patient experience. So number one, public areas of my practice are always extremely clean, neat, and tidy. There's no bigger uh, repellent to somebody than coming into a healthcare office and it's dirty or messy. Like that's the one thing that you just can't abide. It needs to be clean. Not everything has to be fancy. Maybe your office needs a new paint job. Maybe your furniture needs to be updated. I get it, but is it clean? It should be clean and tidy. You know, if you keep it clean and tidy, that's going to help you get on the way to making more money to replace all those things. But if it's not clean, I don't care what what you got going on. It's going to be a problem. Point number two, general areas. So if you have areas that you're sharing with other people in the building, let's say you're in a building and it's a shared restroom for patients. Maybe you have an employee restroom, but patients use a shared restroom in the building. You have to insist that that is just as clean as your office because, again, that just becomes a problem. Number three, demeanor. Patients and new patients coming into my office are always immediately acknowledged and handled in a friendly, polite manner and caring manner. So again, there's that first impression when the patient calls, but then there's the first impression when someone from your office first lays eyes on them and they first lay eyes on your practice. That is, that's going to go a long way with relation to impre- Obviously the first impression was good enough on the phone that they showed up. You don't want to blow it here. So here's where, you know, office conflict, uh, office drama can become a bit of a problem. I was on vacation recently. We went to an establishment where I was talking to the receptionist and the receptionist seemed horribly just just distracted, upset, you know, uh, short, curt, just was not very nice. And so I finally asked, like, is everything okay? And she was upset because her coworkers, there were two or three of them, were in the office behind her. She was at a desk, uh, just, you know, hanging out and chewing the fat and leaving her to do all the work. So she's upset about that, and rightfully so. She should have been. Here's the problem. I'm a customer. Number one, I don't know if she's, I don't know that. I'd ask how many people came up and she treated them poorly that didn't ask that and thought, wow, this place has a problem. Probably a few because the place was busy. But the other thing is as a customer, I can't do anything about that. I'm not going to jump over the desk and go into that back office and go, hey guys, you know, get off your butts. That's not my job. I'm a customer. So you have to have it set up that even if there is some conflict, which there really shouldn't be and you should manage it, Okay. But even if there is some conflict or someone's mad at somebody or someone just screwed up and got in trouble for it or, or you know, uh, got a stern talking to, that cannot be reflected in the person when they are dealing with the public. It's almost like you're on stage. I might be pissed at the director, but if you're sitting in the audience watching me, you would never know because I'm doing my part and I'm doing it professionally. And you have to instill that professionalism in your team or it will turn off new patients and patients of record. Which brings us to number four, reception area. If you have a TV or monitor in your reception area, it's playing educational videos or non-upsetting programs. You know, back in 0809, I think I told this story before in in an earlier episode, uh, Sabri and I – Sabri and I, Sabri, Sabri and I, we're going to a couple of our clients' office, offices up in the Northeast and just, you know, we're visiting because we're in the area. And we had one client telling us how they were having trouble collecting money. 
And the first thing we noticed when they walked in their office, we're waiting for them, is they had – it was either CNN or Fox News, one of these 24-hour news stations. And I'm not indicting a particular news station. I just don't like all news. You know, I don't feel better after watching it, but whatever. So they have this 24-hour news station on and this was during that period when they had the whole housing crisis and the, the market meltdown. And I think the headline as she and I were watching it was like, is the dollar doomed or something like this? So this is what their patients are watching. Then they go back and see the doctor and the doctor recommends, I don't know, eleven, twelve thousand dollars worth of treatment. And they're curious why people aren't paying. So the first thing we had them do is we told them like, look, do you have any educational videos you can put out there? Well, no, we don't. Okay, then put on Animal Planet or HGTV. Put in something that's not offensive, not upsetting, unique and interesting. Okay. So ideally you'd want something educational playing uh, what I'm a fan of. Uh, and, you know, actually I'll reserve this for a future episode because it's really worth talking about, but different videos you can make. It's actually very easy. I'll bring Dan on for this one and um, different procedural explanations as well as patient testimonials. Th- this is really hot. We have a few clients doing this now and it's great to play in your reception area, but make sure whatever's playing in reception isn't going to adversely affect or upset your patients. Okay. Next is wait time. My patients don't wait longer than 10 minutes past their appointment time to be seated, if they wait at all. Pretty self-explanatory. Number six, provider demeanor. The providers and assistants in my practice have a friendly, polite, and professional chairside manner. You expect it at the front, you expect it in the back. Everybody is on their A game and is a pro. I don't care if, you know, office, something's not going well, something just broke, the autoclave's not working. Everybody is on their A game. Patients would never have a clue. Patients would never have a clue. Because again, remember, there's nothing they can do about it. So you're giving them an unsolvable problem. Don't give them that problem. All right, number seven, team relations. I immediately handle upsets amongst my team so that they don't bleed into the patient hours. Again, why would you do that? So that you don't have to have that problem. But even if they do, they can't dramatize them. All right, number eight, atmosphere. Patients would find the atmosphere in my practice friendly, polite, and helpful. Should be calm, should be comfortable. Number nine, emergencies. Every emergency new patient is scheduled for a new patient initial after the emergency treatment is completed. Some people view emergency patients almost as throwaways. I've had people give me their new patient numbers and exclude their emergency new patients. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's a human being. You know, they just have to be turned into a good patient. So part of your procedure after you do your palliative care, you're on them. And the doctor should tell them this. Okay, good. So we've just gotten you out of pain there. Now, listen to me. I need to see you for a full exam. So that's going to take about an hour. So I want to make sure we get you scheduled because we don't want to have a problem like this again. All right. So make sure they're going to ask you to schedule this. You schedule this. Okay. And come in as soon as possible. This should be an attitude that is uniform in your practice. Emergencies get turned into regular patients. All right. Number 10, consults and second opinions. New patient consults and second opinions are also scheduled for new patient initial after treatment is completed. Same thing. We're not just doing one thing. We're turning them into a patient that we're going to retain. Number 11, next recall visit. Patients coming in for a new patient initial are scheduled for their next recall visit after completing their initial cleaning or any needed treatment. I would want this percentage in my practice if I was a dentist to be at 99 or or 100%, 98, 99. I would check it out. Look at the last last 50 new patients you had and that are done with treatment and see how many have a next recall appointment. And if that number is 50% or 30%, you have a problem because then you're spending all this money to get a new patient in and you're throwing them away. You want to keep them in the office. Plus, how are you going to help them long term if you don't see them? You're not. Number 12, welcome and thank you letters. We acknowledge every new patient with a follow-up welcome to the practice letter or something similar. We also acknowledge referral sources with a thank you for your referral letter or something similar each time they refer a patient. This is, again, something you don't want to drop out. It's an important piece of admin. All right. Last points here, folks, on this checklist. Section six is your team. Drilling. We regularly drill, and we have a new concept here, dummy run processes in our office that we have to do with patient management. So what does this mean? If I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's sort of like a trial run. So if I'm working out how my new patient initial line should work, you know, I want to make sure that new patients make it from the phone call to actually showing up in the practice and maybe you run them through hygiene, for example, and they get their x-rays done and then you see them for the exam and you actually have time to present treatment and then they close and they come in and they end up on recall. There's a lot of different steps there, right? So, you trial run it. You practice run it. How do you do that? Well, you'd start with, you know, someone calls the practice and then one of your staff is being the patient and you walk through the lines. So it might be, all right, here they are at reception. What is receptionist going to do? The receptionist does the, and the whole team's there while you're doing this. 
while you're, you're dummy running this or trial run, right? So then what is reception is supposed to do? They're supposed to do these five things. Did they remember? Okay, good. And you'll notice maybe one of the parts of the process are taking a really long time or maybe one of the parts of the process is stupid and you don't need to do it anymore. This is how you find this stuff out. It takes it from the page and turns it into real life, which it always is going to have. You're going to turn it into real life when you're doing it with a patient, but you're better off finding things that you don't need to do anymore, things that are lunky or not a good part of the process or things that are missing. Better to find that out when it's not a patient than with a patient. Okay. This way you don't lose the patient. So you practice this regularly so you don't miss out on things. And number two is correction. Anything that arises while you're doing this, you correct it. Anyway, I know again, I mentioned it earlier, this is a longer than usual episode. I blew that 30 minute, uh, 30 minutes or less concept away. But this thing is really important if you want to maximize these effort. I definitely recommend that you run this checklist up against your practice. Uh, maybe you find that 50% of the points are out. Don't panic. Uh, do it in sequence. I would make sure my basics were in. Like I'm not going to go crazy about the fact that I'm not uh, sending welcome and thank you letters out if I have nobody responsible for new patients. I'm going to handle that first. Like get your basic requirements in first. This is something I'd want to hold up against my practice and check on a routine basis, maybe quarterly or every six months or at least once a year to see if I'm missing anything because I want to maximize those new patient efforts and make it as easy as possible to spur practice growth. Anyway, folks, Thank you guys for sticking with me. If you stuck with me for this longer episode, I appreciate it. Uh, that's all I have for you this week. If you have any questions about MGE, you can find us online at mgeonline.com or call us at 800-640-1140. Uh, have a great week and I will see you at the next episode.